Submarines. They're one of those things everybody knows of, but not much about. They're boats that go underwater, and not in a titanic kind of way. What else is there to know? Well, there are many questions that can arise from the concept, such as, what if a submarine sinks? Do submarines have lifeboats? How do submarines dive? Will I answer these questions? Probably not, but it's still good to think a few thoughts every now and again. In the year 1578, Englishman William Bourne devised a blueprint for a submersible rowboat consisting of a wooden hull sealed with watertight leather and closed holes for oars to go through, submerging by using vices to pull in collapsible walls of the hull. This was just an overly complicated concept to Bourne, and although he was incredibly intuitive and had nautical experience from his time in the Royal Navy, he lacked the resources to go through with his idea. His goal was not reached in his lifetime, instead a Dutch inventor named Cornelis Drebbel constructed a similar watercraft in the 1620s and traveled at a depth of 12 feet down the River Thames. Apparently, King James himself briefly went aboard the tiny watercraft as well, so one could say hope for the royal family sank a while ago. The early 1700s brought many new advancements in submarine technology, including a design using goat skins as ballast tanks for some reason. Dozens of patents were filed for these designs, and all were generally sufficient submarines, but being human beings, we soon began to wonder, how can we use these to harm each other? Thus, the first submarine designated for naval warfare was created in 1775 by one David Bushnell. It was meant to ram British warships with a screw before screwing in a powder magazine on a fuse set to detonate with enough time to get away. This odd-looking submarine was known as the Turtle, and looked just as ridiculous as its creator, William Bushnell, did. I only kid, however, Bushnell wasn't only intelligent for designing the turtle, but a brave man for actually sailing it. The only thing is it was found to be ineffective in sinking or even corkscrewing any British vessels as it struggled to pierce the hull. Although the submarine was fairly useless, it was a huge milestone in innovation for naval technology, utilizing metal bands as sealant between wooden planks instead of any leather-based sealant. Not to mention it looked like a massive barrel. A few more submarine models came and went, most notably in the Napoleonic Wars, where one guy tried to convince first the French, and then his enemy, the British, to invest in his submarines. You rock star. In the War of 1812, the Americans built a copy of the Turtle to try and sink the HMS Ramillies in New London Harbor. This time, the corkscrew succeeded in screwing in the hull, but broke loose before the explosive could be planted. Submarines are currently 0 for 2. Now we come to the 1860s, when the Confederacy had a problem and some dastardly southern gentlemen had a solution. The Federal Navy had launched a naval blockade of all southern ports and were preventing the Confederacy from selling their cotton to international vendors, effectively crushing a major industry of the southern economy. The aforementioned dastardly southern men were Horace L. Hunley, James R. McClintock, and Baxter Watson. And their solution was a larger submarine, but not only that, a metal submarine. With the British and French in an arms race over ironclads, metal ships were certainly possible, but a metal submarine was just pure insanity. Despite all this, Hunley succeeded in financing their construction, and thus the Pioneer was launched in fall of 1861. She was 20 feet long and utilized a hand crank screw propeller manned by two crew members. She also had one man maintain ballast tanks to secure desired depth, and had the captain con and steer the ship with a rudder that was curiously at the bow. She was six feet tall from keel to top with a quarter inch thick metal shell. She had a quote unquote torpedo in the form of a barbed explosive charge fixated on a pole to the front of the sub that would attach to an enemy vessel. As the sub moved away after the torpedo was attached, it would pull a lanyard that would activate a primer, detonating the explosive. It was pretty intuitive for the time, or it would have been if it ever actually got to be used. Although she did succeed in a diving test on a nearby lake, she sank from an unknown cause soon after, killing her entire crew in the process. However, the determined men weren't discouraged and still believed that this was a worthy cause to be fighting for and had her raised. Despite this, as soon as the Yankees breached the Mississippi River, the Confederates scuttled Pioneer to prevent the submarine from falling into northern hands. The boys moved to Mobile Bay, Hunley's hometown, where they continued their intellectual journey by building two more submarines. The first was a failure and the second a near failure. The first was called American Diver and was a 25-foot long metal sub with plans of utilizing a revolutionary electric magnet engine, which was insanely advanced for the era. Most likely due to insufficient technology, the team shelved the idea and instead attempted to secure a small steam engine to power the sub. I know what you're thinking though, how could they use a steam engine without filling the cabin with smoke from the machine? Well, the engine would be run before she set sail so they could build pressure up and use it to propel her, albeit in short bursts of a few hours. 
Wartime materials were scarce in Mobile, however, so they put a pin in this idea too. Ultimately, they went back to the traditional hand crank, this time with four crew members occupying it instead of two. This lacked the power to sufficiently propel her in the currents of the Gulf of Mexico, but at this point Hunley and his crew was too far in to quit. After an unsuccessful attack on the blockade, he sent the submarine via tow to Fort Morgan, but it promptly sank in a storm. For all you Confederate sympathizers out there, don't fret, the crew escaped unharmed. As far as I can tell, I don't think they ever found the wreck, so there's something to do over the summer. The final submarine Hunley, McClintock, and Watson attempted to build was a ship named for its builder, known as the CSS Hunley, or HL Hunley. This clunky hunk of metal was built out of an old steam boiler and was 35 feet long, housing a crew of up to nine men, eight of which would operate the hand crank. Shout out to all my claustrophobia fans, the submarine was so tight the crew members couldn't pass each other inside, and the only interior lighting was done by candle. She also didn't have a snorkel, meaning the candles used up precious and very limited oxygen. Quite intuitive. She was shipped by train to Charleston, South Carolina, and launched in 1863. From here, the CSS Hunley was really just a mess. While sitting next to a dock with her hatches open and crew inside, a wave from a nearby ferry boat flooded her interior, sinking her quickly, with only one survivor being her senior officer, John Payne. She was raised and continued her career. Next, a sudden storm sank her. This time, John Payne survived again along with two other crew members. She was raised again, only to capsize a short while after, this time with four of her nine crew escaping. Her fourth yet somehow not final sinking occurred when she grounded on the soft mud of Charleston Harbor and slowly sank, killing all of her crew inside, including our hero John Payne. She was raised, but at this point Confederate naval authorities were very skeptical of her capabilities despite Hunley insisting on finding another crew. While doing a test run in late 1863, she collided with an anchor cable of a nearby ship and sank quickly, claiming another nine lives, one of which was unfortunately of her creator, Horace Hunley. With all these terrible incidents, five sinkings up to this point, she was named the Peripatetic Coffin. To her credit, the sub did do another test run after being raised and stayed under for two hours, even after a pump failed and she had to be repaired. Despite this, she still met her ultimate end and her sixth and final sinking was her most famous. In February of 1864, she sailed near the naval blockade with the intention of finally detonating a torpedo on a northern warship, and she succeeded. She approached the USS Housatonic, a sloop of war, and using a copper pipe to deliver the explosive instead of a wooden rod, it succeeded in sinking the ship. The only thing is, the trip was a suicide mission, and the submarine H.L. Hunley's crew was supposedly struck with pulmonary blast trauma, killing them all quickly and resulting in her pumps failing without anyone to operate them. She sank soon after the Housatonic, bringing an end to the obscure Confederate submarine program. Now if your intellectual specialty is Confederate submarine research, you may wish to happily correct me in the comment section after you gloss over Wikipedia for 11 seconds. I want to clarify that for whatever reason, every different source I used for research is either missing something or has some info none of the others have. With that in mind, I used the U.S. Navy Institute's page on the H.L. Hunley as a primary source, finding it to be pretty universal with stories. It has listed six sinkings of the vessel, while Wikipedia only says three. I'm saying six because I think it's funnier and I think it makes a better YouTube video, and historically Wikipedia seems to be intellectually lacking. Putting all that aside, I find the Confederate submarine program to be a weird little footnote from history from a team of determined innovators who were way ahead of their time. Thank you for wasting the last nine minutes of your life with me.